welcome to the Evolving Digital Self podcast, where we explore the conscious use of technology. Listen in to hear thought leaders and other guests discuss the human relationship with technology and learning to thrive in the digital era. Hosted by the author of the international best-selling digital self-mastery series and being at work, Dr. Heidi Forbes Usta. Welcome back to the Evolving Digital Self podcast. Today, I'm excited to introduce to you a good friend of mine, Mary Ann Pierce. She is the founder and CEO of Map Digital, and boy, does this woman know how to make meetings work in the digital age. Welcome, Mary Ann. Thanks, Heidi. I'm so excited to be on your podcast. Just to give everybody a little bit of background, I have to say, so I met Mary Ann through connections and other people and the wonderful world of digital that we had some mutual connections, but she brought me in for a conference in Poland. And boy, I have never been treated so well as a speaker in terms of just understanding the impact of your speaking, who's really responding to it, all of that feedback that we desire as a speaker. And it was just a very powerful experience to see meetings done well. And I would love for you to share with our listeners, because I think it's such a, an immensely changing industry, sort of your experience, what brought you to where you are now, and uh, how digital has impacted that. Oh, gosh, that's, that's well, first of all, thank you very much. Um, you are amazing to work with. And I think I must give a lot of credit to the organizers of Masters and Robots in Warsaw who curated the content and, and many of the speakers. I did help bring some speakers, uh, you know, to help uh, augment. But it was also their respect and their real deep commitment to bring the very best in the, the fourth industrial revolution of like with Davos, you know, with the Internet of Things and future of work, they curate the best conference. And that, that made a really great start. And what we've learned at Map Digital, you know, we've been in the digital, the internet space of events for almost 25 years. So I'm a pioneer. What we've learned is, is that content at conferences is used, is thought as being ephemeral, but we see it as a digital asset. And we look at speakers as thought leaders. And thought leaders, what you're saying is enhancing, you know, your thought and your brand, but also by us associating me in the conference with our speakers and making sure that they're incredibly well presented, you know, the AV and everything that's on site, but also the after, the digital afterlife of the event that we, in the conferences, that we're also benefiting from your thought leadership to your network. So it becomes this mutual beneficial society, getting those webcasts up right away, making sure that your presentations are up on the website and people can engage in that content. That's great because that you can send it out to your, your network. And then we're also enhancing our network with, you know, with your brand. So, you know, it kind of becomes this, uh, this mutual admiration society that builds a larger community for both the speaker as well as for the conference brand. Yeah. And I mean, it's just, it's an incredible thing to see the evolution of that. I mean, having been a speaker for many years now, you know, it used to be basically in that moment, you do your presentation or you're at a conference and you see a presentation. And then, you know, if you don't capture everything in that moment, it's gone. That's the end mm -hmm. of that. And there's very rarely the, the good documentation. And even if there is good documentation, it's often not shared beyond the people that are organizing it. So to really give it a life and legs to have the impact that it, it can is, is a very powerful tool. And I think we have to think, and this is this this is this might sound like a little flip, but I think that the first thing about conferences, I look at conferences, is that the attendee is at the center. It has to be attendee focused. And what does the attendee want? I mean, they want access to the content, the slides. They also want to network. They want to be purposeful. But there's also like an afterlife, and that they. I literally will say when an attendee is sitting in the audience, I'm not just speaking to that one person. I'm speaking to 2,000 people on their social networks. You know, that thought leadership getting out there, and especially when you're working with new innovative technology and sort of concepts, or we also do our pro bono work in diversity and inclusion. I want to get that message out there. So it's not just presenting it to that one person who voted with their feet physically to show up. But I also want to get that thought leadership and that investigation into a larger community 
via usually social media that will help us move the needle, that will help us create better futures. That's so great. I, it's really, you know, I commend you for what you guys are doing. What have been some of your favorite events to work on where you have seen that extension of the work that you're doing really have that uh, expansion of, of thought leadership that you desire? Oh, well, you know, we just, you know, we just to, to give you full disclosure, I mean, we've been doing it for a long time, but in a real business to business way. And uh, Map Digital has been working mostly out of New York, but now we're global. And when you work in New York City, you work with the financial institutions. And we went digital very, very quickly around 2000. And I'll give you a little background because uh, the SCC mandated that any publicly company, traded company that goes into a, a meeting or anything in the public, they say anything that might change their stock, and that information has to be disseminated live. So that made webcasting ubiquitous in all the conferences that we were doing for our major financial service clients. So we got very familiar, like how digital content via webcasting or how they people shared uh, the slides and how they, you know, what they questions they asked. We were up in that, let's say that global village, that web space for a long time. And then once we developed our MetaMeetings platform as a purely scalable, robust system, a platform as a service, not just, you know, let's just knit some together some tables and go webcast. So it really is an engine. We went out to really not promote business to business, but thought leadership. We figured, you know, we, we're really, really uh, vested in, the, uh, in making businesses very successful. Now let's see how we can go and help some of the some of the, the conferences of new ideas, as well as what we hold to be extremely precious is diversity, especially cognitive diversity. So we um, we volunteered to work with a conference that's based out of Ireland. That's called Inspire Fest, and it is a leading science, arts, and technology conference celebrating diversity. Uh, where over 50% of the speakers are women, or of all makes and shapes. And uh, a totally Irish fest because it has the arts, there's conversations, as we say in our own good crack, and there's a huge, deep investigation. So they need it to, they're very well known in Britain, Ireland, parts of Western Europe. They wanted to come to the United States, and they're not very well known. So we said, gosh, how can we take us, we did a salon for them in New York, how can we take what content you've had before and what we're doing here in New York and let's just blast it out into the social media and to see how many people could we expose to the brand Inspire Fest, to the content and especially to the speakers and so we could move that needle on what their recognition was in the United States and so we proceeded to do that and we uh, put all of our statistics into IBM Watson and came out with some pretty incredible, first of all, insights, as well as reach. The content was stellar, it was delivered well, and it traveled really far. So we are really happy about that. And it was very successful. And did it result in more people coming over to Dublin and uh, buying tickets? Yeah, it did. I would say at least I could have count for 10 people that I knew was touched by what we did in New York, and then also what hit the cloud. So we're trying to see how we can See that cloud, that you know, that global village, those communities, you know, and uh, use what's happening live in an event or what did happen in an event, and really influence well beyond the space and time of the, of the, the temporal event. That's so great, yeah. So, what has been your sense of the feedback from either participants or in terms of what what ways are they consuming the content differently? Well, how has that changed over time? Because, I mean, obviously we've seen this huge evolution now that in, in you know, with the introduction of the iPhone and mm-hmm. everybody having smartphones, we've moved predominantly into mobile. But I think there's a lot of other factors just in the ability that, you know, the higher bandwidths and speeds. So what have you seen in that change too? Yeah, I, it definitely is mobile. I mean, everything's mobile. Unless you get home at night and you know you have a glass of wine, you open your laptop and you go on Facebook. But it, the delivery method method is fast and furious, and, and mobile obviously is, especially on site at a conference. I consider the mobile device to be my the biggest one, of the biggest platforms I have to work on. 
you know, that is my, that's my life bridge to the attendee. You know, that is something that that's where I serve up all the digital content as well as wayfinding and other information, you know, scheduling and stuff. One of the things that I'm interested that I'm starting to see is that, and I guess I go back to Marshall McLuhan and I get, you know, the whole global village concept. And we're really very tribal as people. And I, what I saw from the Inspire Fest, especially since we, we went out on, um, on Twitter, on YouTube, uh, Facebook, heavily promoted by multiple people and some of the speakers who were using their social network to get that content out. One speaker had, had like 4,000, 400,000 people like on LinkedIn or something, something incredibly insane. So we were hitting huge networks. And what I was seeing was, is that people really want to be surrounded by a tribe that once, if they liked what was going on with InspireFest, they started to follow the speakers or follow InspireFest and they start to join as a member. So one thing that McLuhan said is that, you know, content, digitized content will feed the campfires of the, of the global village. So if you start taking things down on, you know, more, you know, terrestrial levels, I started seeing people who, you know, just would keep following us because they kind of like the content and they also were liking the other comments of the other people. So it wasn't just the one-on-one hitting of the content. You also, once you engaged in um, the Inspire Fest, you know, community, cloud community, you found a real community up there, all based on that campfire of, you know, diversity, STEM, you know, arts, you know, th- thinking differently about, you know, how, we, how we're going to program this, this universe of ours. Mm. So that's what I found. I found it really became almost, it became very human. That's such a wonderful feature of the really bringing together the social factor of connection mm. and, uh, and the ability to do that with the technologies as they evolve. I'm curious because obviously you're saying that the, the mobile device is really for you. It's the connection to the entire community. It's the connection to how you're running your programs and delivering content and all of that. Are you one of those people that carries two, one for work and one for life? Or how do you balance those two pieces? Well, I don't have a work-life balance. <laughs> I do in a way, but, you know, as a founder and as a, and as a female entrepreneur m- maverick in a very male-dominated industry, I mean, not the events industry, so to speak, but we can get into software. It's sort of like what I do in, some, in many ways is, my work almost becomes my art. You know, it's something that I, when we get to, to try these things, it's very, very fascinating. So it stops being work in a way to kind of like being my dream time or my, my, my art time. But I, you know, obviously do have to like switch it off. And that's why I do have, I have a house in the country in Pennsylvania, which has really bad signal. So it wouldn't matter. You know, if you know me, you know where to get me, your family. The other people won't get to me because, you know, Verizon signal is really weak there. But um, yeah, no, I don't have two. I just have one device and I'm always on. Well, so you probably have a landline still. Uh, I do. Yeah, 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 I do. But that's New York. It's here. Well, and you're on the road. And that's another element to this is really the ability to, you know, as a founder and as a, a business supporter and community builder, you know, I've never seen you in the same place once. Twice, I should say. So, I mean, you're on the road all the time, and yet you bring your community with you. Well, yeah. Isn't that interesting? It's like, it's almost like there was a book a long time ago about the accidental tourist, you know, where you travel in your, you travel in your, um, I think it's Ambiti, where you travel with your favorite comfy chair. And I think that a lot of us are that, is that we bring our community with us. And that's one of the most beautiful things about what has happened with digital and social media, you know, in many ways, too, you know, I'm, my mother's parents emigrated from Ireland, and it used to be an occasional letter, rarely a phone call. Now it's social media. I know what they're naming the new cow. It's just amazing how it's brought our family and our community together. And it's always there. You know, I can always, you know, obviously I'll spend enormous amounts of time on Facebook. But when you do, I do it because it's basically to keep my community. Maybe that becomes my personal. I can see all the baby pictures and the Eagles won the Super Bowl. Yay! You know, like good stuff. 
I had to put that plug in. I'm a silly girl at heart. Yeah, I hear you. And and, uh, amidst all of that, of course, there's a question of being able to take care of ourselves and and well-being. What do you use? Do you have any tools that you you use to take care of your well-being? You spend a lot of time on your phone and on your computer and on the go and on planes and whatnot. Do you have any tips and tricks for road warriors that have you found have been successful for you? Oh, it's a really good question. I decided that I was going to take up guerrilla gardening. So when I go home, uh, to well, I call home New Hope, Pennsylvania, but I live in New York City also. I really need to be outside. I need to be in the air. I need to have my, my hands in the dirt. I need to be watching and being a steward over living things. Just, you know, looking at the birds. I've, I have three bluebird houses on my property. I'm so proud of them. And I need just to completely go native. And I also find myself that I have to go to live events, but not conferences. I have to see theater. I have to see something that is live, that is connected with people, that's tribal, you know, going in a darkened space and watching people act out rituals and myths and stuff like that. And I have to go see art. I have to see something nonverbal. Mostly, I have to see an aestheticness. So that's how I stop. And of course, you know, I have to see friends. You have to have dinner. You have to break bread and, 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 and spend time. But I find that I really carve out time to almost go to unplug completely. Good for you. And with that thought, unplugging, we're going to take a quick moment to have a word from our sponsor, and we'll be right back. This episode is brought to you by Oscar Wellness. When pain stops, life begins. Oscar Pulse mimics the body's own recovery processes to relieve pain, muscle stiffness, and inflammation using optimized pulsed electromagnetic field technology, PEMF, to encourage recovery at a cellular level so you can get back to life. And I gotta tell you, this thing works so well, my husband and I are fighting over it. So I highly recommend you take a moment and try it out. They have all kinds of options for checking it out, and they've even given us an opportunity to share a discount with you, $55, by using the 2BU code on the Oscar Wellness site. You can check out the show notes to get more details. Welcome back to the Evolving Digital Self Podcast, and today we have Marianne Pierce, founder and CEO of Map Digital. We're having a great conversation about the evolving event industry and ways to support it with digital means. We've been going through an interesting journey about talking about impact on self and the way you can grow communities and your tribe. We're also, I would love to hear a little bit more about some of your favorite stories of ways that you've seen digital change and change the way events really occur. You know, it used to be there was an event and a stage and you had to send out mailers. And how have you seen sort of what has been the most drastic change that you've seen in the industry? Well, it hasn't really happened yet, but it's happening. It's really interesting is to me, events follow retail. You know, that people come to a store to do something, okay? You know, that they vote with their feet is what I say. And you can see how retail is being disrupted. And in the event industry, they're still they're on the tipping point of a major, major push. And we're starting to see big mergers. UBM, um, Informa just bought UBM, which is like, that's like, you know, what would be the IBM buying Xerox back in the old days because they both have lost their valuation, but that kind of level of bigness. What we are seeing is that there has to be a change in the mindset of the organizer, the person who's producing it, is what is an event. As far as the attendee is concerned, anything you give to them digitally, they'll accept. And what I mean by that is that we, when we do our conferences, it's not about, you know, doing the webcasting and collecting the PowerPoints, having an interactive conference website and digital signage and, you know, all that great stuff. We also provide the Internet access, the wireless. And I will tell you, if you give them the access to hit the cloud, they will use every last drop of bandwidth and IP 
and they will shape their experience. The more you give them with the digital platform, as long as you introduce it, of course, you can't, you have to also, that's because you build it, they're going to come. You have to integrate it within the whole body of, of the meeting. People will embrace it. And one of the biggest fallacies, and I keep hearing it still from very large companies, is that if you capture the session content, you don't have to do the slide. Because at Masters and Robots, we had like a 12 hour delay. Okay. Because there was no reason to do it live. Because we didn't have an audience. We hadn't developed one yet. By sending out your content, that that will cannibalize on your attendee ticket sales. And I think that is to be a complete and total fallacy. I believe that by sending that goodness out into the cloud, you are seeding, you're developing influencers' interest who will then become attendees. You know, you're, you're by generosity sharing that information, that thought leadership, you'll start to increase your marketing viability. So I think that the, this, there's a dichotomy. The attendee would like to have everything at their fingertip and also personalized and served up to them because we know by the data that we've been collecting about you, Heidi, that these are the sectors that you're interested in and we're already going to pre-register you for it. Because, you know, we just want to be able to, to please you. The organizers are still afraid that digital is going to eat their revenue. They don't really see where it's going to make them more money. And they really resist it. It's quite interesting because you see, you know, some conferences now will have sort of you can either sign up for it to attend virtually and then be able to get the live stream or have access to slides and videos later. Because it's a lot of travel is what it really comes down to. And mm -hmm. some people choose not to attend purely because they don't have the extra day on either end to be able to travel to, whether it's to Warsaw or whether it's to New York City. So I think that there's an interesting component there of sort of where's the balance where you're growing your audience and your tribe or whether it's actually cannibalizing your your event. It's interesting, but I think that there is a business model that maybe we don't, that, that, that really is the majority of the, of the meetings industry, and that is the conference trade show. So that is really another level because the organizer who they really truly want to please is the exhibitor and the sponsor. And who are they leveraging? The attendee to come into their booth. So if the attendee doesn't show up, there's a whole there's a whole issue there, so it gets a little more complicated. About we, you always have to follow the money trail. How is the organizer going to make money? And when they don't quite understand, first of all, data that can be collected, you know how you can digitize things, and how it can you know how can it you know produce a larger playing field, both terrestrially as well as in the in the cloud. You're going to resist it. Because it is too abstract, and I don't know if there's really any one event or team of people who are doing it. We're aspiring to do it, but we know we can't do it alone. We have to do it with other best of providers of technology platforms I would think to that bring it all together. Yeah. yeah. I think there's a lot of room to grow and evolve in terms of innovating how to have a virtual visit to the showroom or to the expo as well, because... You know, for example, that used to go to, whenever you went to events, you would, you know, they'd give you a bag and it was full of all these flyers. And, you know, if you're flying in and you're yeah. not checking your bag, that's the first thing that gets chucked. You're not going to even look through it. You know, maybe when you get back to your hotel room, you need something to read while you're, you know, doing your business. <laughs> um, but generally that stuff doesn't even get looked at. And now a lot of events seem to, you know, give you all the links so that you can see it that way. But there must be some way that we can evolve that so you can have a virtual experience with each of the trade show providers because I love the expos. I mean, I think that's one of my mm -hmm. favorite things to experience is sort of see who's involved here and who's willing, you know, who's really interested in, you know, having a voice in this community. And to that note, there's the ways to engage the community. So I'd love for you to talk a little bit about you guys, you used a particular app that helped people network pre and during event and I guess uh -huh. post event. So there's sort of, you know, those two things I think overlap a little. Can you talk a little bit about that? 
Yeah, I think that it was it's two points that you made that are great. And the first one is the one about, you know, trade shows and they want the people to show up. I would think I would challenge my industry to start looking very closely at what Amazon is doing. Amazon was the totally digital presence. But now Amazon's becoming a physical presence by the purchase of Whole Foods, as well as they have their Amazon store. So they've just done a flip, okay? So if you can think about it, if the organizer keeps that data, that rich data collection of con- and serves up content and has a rich data portfolio on that attendee, essentially, it doesn't really matter, attendee or virtual attendee, whether they come or not, because through analytics and meta tagging, then an organizer can say to those exhibitors, here are the people who came on site, who, who attended virtually, who are predisposed to be interested in your product. Then you start getting into another level of monetization, and it gets very interesting. But they don't do that. So they don't, you know, it's basically, if they do, they might have 12 different technology providers on site who aren't integrated, and it's definitely a Tower of Babel. So they're completely, they probably would love to do it, they just don't know how. They can't dig out of that that hole yet. And then the other um, uh, question you asked is a, is a really terrific company out of London called Grip. Like, you know, you have a strong handship grip. And uh, they were very generous uh, to provide their platform to Masters in Robots pro bono, because I asked them to, because I wanted to, to propel the success of that conference. And what they do is they uh, attendees sign up for Grip, you can give your LinkedIn address, you know, whatever. Your really your email address becomes your your uh, personal identifier. And what they do, meaning Grip, is that they use artificial intelligence to go through the 1,000 attendees at Masters and Robots and to see where there could be possible matches. So they're basically going for what your meta tag does. Your meta tag talk to my meta tag, and if it does, maybe we should connect. So the first level with Grip is that they match people. Then you get your own you get your own portal, your own microsite on it, and they start suggesting people who are actually there on site that you might be interested in meeting. And they give you the reasons, and they give you like how strongly do you match. So it's kind of like a polite Tinder for the event industry, but it's pretty effective actually. And then the next step you can do is that you can connect with each other and you can talk to each other without exchanging email addresses. So you can still maintain a level of privacy if you choose. And the next step is that you can say, hey, let's meet up. And there's a a, you know, a section within the app where you can say, OK, I'll meet you at 530 at the Ikea or at the press table or at the, you know, and we set up certain stations within Masters and Robots where people could meet and they were meeting. And it was really, really interesting. So what that trip does is two things. It puts the attendee at the center. You are helping them to be very effective. When people go on uh, on conferences, it's not just about the content. It's about the networking. So you're helping them navigate. Now, if it's 1,000 people, how about if it's 20,000 people? You know, you're really helping them shape the most maximum experience for them, how they will measure success. And that's just terrific. And the other thing that it does is that the organizer, we collect the metadata. We collect the data of, well, who was, who was trending? Were people really interested in, in startups, IoT, uh, people who were, you know, who were general managers? We start getting really sociological as well as sector metadata, which really then informed and helped, let's say, bring deeper, deeper residents to uh, the analytic reports that we did later. And it's like, if you, I believe that you continue to think, what does my attendee want? How can I make their experience better? You're going to find a plenty, plenty of business applications that will be really great. You know, you bring up an interesting point with having these analytics and the connections, uh, you know, Imagine all of these different pieces that are digital, they require huge amounts of bandwidth and the ability to be online and connected simultaneously uh, with the event. And, you know, so how does that impact the choice of location and the partners in the process of developing these events? Because I would think, you know, some locations may be beautiful and wonderful, but 
you know, I've been to plenty of conferences where it was a complete fail because people couldn't get online. Well, I think, first of all, I mean, I don't leave home unless I have connectivity. I just don't, you know, I mean, like, and if I don't, if I'm in the country, then the phone goes away, you know, into, you know, into the shed uh, until I can get a signal again. I think it's really, first of all, bandwidth does not cost that much. I mean, having robust bandwidth and wireless connection doesn't cost that much. And, you know, it's the price has gone down. It's become a commodity and organizers still do not understand that it's not just the food and beverage, it's not just the keynote speaker or the meet and greet cocktail reception, it's also how you can give that attendee what they need to do to continue to work, explore, meet, all under your brand, under your aegis. And, and believe me, I've been providing, our company was started as network services. So we've been bringing in bandwidth since like 1996. I mean, I used to throw cat fives over roofs so we could, like, extend Internet from one building to another. Back in the old days, we called it Spider-Net, like Spider-Man. And I think it's ridiculous. I think it's short-sighted. And I've uh, been crying in my industry for over 20 years is that, you know, you have, to, you have to give them the vehicle to the cloud. And then once you get to the cloud, once you get that, that conference to the cloud, there's unlimited real estate unlimited opportunities for engagement and unlimited opportunities for monetization. But they don't see it that way. They see it as a $10,000 cost that, oops, I can do it that, and I'll put it in the cocktail party. But they don't really, they, they're just not, they haven't, they haven't drank the Kool-Aid yet. They have not bought that religion yet. Well, hopefully we're not too far off. When you start getting <laughs> feedback and comments of like, <laughs> oh, you know, I couldn't connect. It was such a drag. I mean, you hear that so much at different conferences. I mean, even at CES recently, I was kind of yeah. amazed. There were certain pockets where you just couldn't get online. You couldn't get a. You couldn't even get a phone signal. It was like someone had put a block in there. Well, you know, there's some properties, and I won't name their names. They do. They do scramble the cell the signal. I mean, it's. It really has to be. You know, first of all, it's almost like oxygen at this point. You know, if people can't get a signal, the the it's interesting because the New York subway system has internet at certain stations. And then if you have a long distance between the stations, it cuts out. And it's like, you know, gosh, it was so great like two years ago to get it. Now I'm like, oh my gosh, it cut out. You know, I have to wait to 125th Street before I can send this email. It's, it's, it's how we live our lives now. And it's like, it's very short-sighted not to provide that. But I will say that the people in, in, in Warsaw they chose this industrial space. It's totally cool, but they brought in a tremendous amount of infrastructure to make that happen, and they thought it was that important. And that helped make the show, and that helped make us be very successful in serving up the content in practically just a little delayed time so that the on-site attendees were literally watching the videos that happened the day before at lunch on day two. They were really consuming the content. That's so great. And I, I look forward to seeing more meetings that happen that way because it's certainly yeah. been a mixed bag for me in, in experiences both as an attendee and as a speaker. So, so excited about the work that you're doing and hope more people will adopt some of your systems, whether it's going with the meta meetings platform or just really learning from the work that you're doing. So just to make sure that people can find you to see how to potentially work with you or understand about the different events that you're involved in, where do people find you? Well, our footprint is pretty low at this point. And you always go to our website, mapdigital.com. And we are, you know, talking about your digital self. I mean, it's almost like the shoemaker's children. We are starting to spend a lot more time and attention about having, talking about what we're doing in a helpful way and sharing some of the insights. So there's going to be a lot more publishing on LinkedIn as well as maybe I'll even do my own podcast. But uh, at this point, I have my two people, uh, not just that we're, you know, we're finished with the platform, we're always going to be tweaking it, but the, the major, major heavy lifting is done. So now we're going to, to, to really try to create this forum to talk about where we're going in the, the digital ecosystem around events. And there's also talk about that we just might even do our own conference and invite 
every like basically throw everything we know to be true at it. So that's some of the talk that I'm having with my board of directors saying, I think it's time for us to get a showcase and invite all of our friends and fellow uh, technology providers to do a showcase that basically, and do a primer. This is how, this is how you can do it. It's not, it, it's, it's not easy, but it can be done. I love it. Well, I look forward to hearing more about that. I encourage mm-hmm. all of you out there listening to go check out her work and uh, see it. As her communication pieces evolve, there's a lot of stuff happening there. So definitely follow her and figure out, let's see, tw- your Twitter idea is Mary Ann Pierce. And all of those contact pieces and components will be listed in the show notes. So you can find out where they're involved and what they're doing and how they're impacting the event industry. Because, you know, and again, one of the ones that she mentioned, Inspire Fest, definitely go check out that one too. It sounds like a great yeah. event. This has been so wonderful. Do you have any final last comments or tips that you would like to share with our listeners today? You know, I think a a lot of what I'd like to share is, you know, just being influenced by meeting and talking with you. I also really have great fond memories when I came to visit you in Tiburon. We took our meeting hiking up in the hills with dogs and I go, wow, this is a really great concept to do a meeting. It's so un-New York and it was so appreciated. And in fact, I brought like not suitable shoes. And I think that digital has really, really changed us in many ways, but in in some ways has caused more isolation, perhaps, but also in other ways has created a stronger sense of community and tribe. And I also just would like to also say that, you know, even with the, my mother who's elderly, giving her an iPad, I mean, she's basically knitting while researching things on YouTube, like, you know, how to, how to fix the drain pipe. I mean, it's unbelievable how they've adapted that because it keeps them not in isolation, you know, besides, you know, talking with people and FaceTime and things like that. I think it really has fundamentally changed us. And I think we need to embrace that change and then see it as something that there is, there's probably a very strong metaphysic shift that's happening too, that is in some ways hard to describe, but I see it as, as breaking down barriers and by sharing information and experience, you're also in helping elevate other people's lives. So there's something very wonderful and spiritual. Uh, creating better futures is what I call it. And um, it's something that I'd like to spend a little more time thinking about and talking to others about, and especially you. Because you're the one who's piqued a couple of my interests and some things that you said again. Interesting. I pursue that deeper. Because it's, and that, it's not just about propelling things forward. I think that ultimately, well, there's always good and bad. I think the good in it is being the equalness it can create in our world of knowledge sharing and all that good stuff. I love it. Well, I look forward to more walk and talks with you in nature and in life. <laughs> and there's just so many great things that we can touch on. And we could continue this conversation for hours, I'm sure. For hours. Our <laughs> listeners are, they, they've got other things to do. Um, but we'll definitely love to continue this conversation on another date. And thank you so much for joining us today. It has been such a treat to have you, Mary Ann Pierce, founder and CEO of MAP Digital. Thank you to our listeners for joining us today on The Evolving Digital Self. Don't forget to subscribe so you don't miss any of the great talks and conversations we have about how technology is changing different industries and how we can learn how to thrive both in work and life as it rapidly evolves with us. We'll look forward to seeing you again soon and take care for now. Bye-bye. Thank you for joining us for The Evolving Digital Self. Be sure to subscribe on your favorite podcast app now so that you don't miss a single episode. While you're at it, please give us a rating and a review and join the digital self-mastery movement to create more conscious use of technology by sharing it and telling your friends. Want to see where you fit on the digital self spectrum and how it might be impacting your business and relationships? Get your free copy of Digital Self Mastery today by clicking on the link in the show notes.